I know that all of you are excited to hear what's coming out of my mouth today, just as much as I am, but I tell you what, I am pulling the fast one on you. We are blessed. I don't know how many of you were here when we had the baby dedication for Mia a couple of years ago. Uh, we had a wonderful time, but we also had a wonderful participant in that service, and that happens to be Stephen, who is with us today. Um, God love him. He was inspiring that day. Um, knowing that he was here today, I was excited. I went up to him and asked him if he would like to share the word with us before they take off to Puerto Rico. And willfully he is. And so we are blessed. Um, I'm going to introduce Stephen. Um, I think you say Estefan huh? in, in Spanish, is that correct? Okay, so I'm not Spanish, but it works. I love tacos. So that should make up for that. But nonetheless, I am so blessed. Uh, we are blessed to have him. He is gifted, um, and it's exciting to have him with us and his family. And so at this time, we're going to ask Stephen to come up, and he's going to bless us with the word today. Just so you can uh, get to know me a little bit better, my uh, wife is Tara Vetter, uh, that's uh, Teddy's uh, sister, one of the many. And we have four kids, Elijah, Enoch, Evan, and a little baby, Eliana. Last time we were here we did not have the baby, but now we do. Um, and the last four and a half years of my life I was uh, studying a PhD program at Asbury Seminary. Uh, and now we're in transition going to Puerto Rico where I will be teaching uh, in the Adventist University of the Antillian. Uh, it's in Mayagüez and uh, we have a home there for you. If anyone wants to uh, come to Puerto Rico, you're welcome to look us up and we'll be there. <laughs> um, also, I'm thankful uh, Pastor John uh, was uh, gracious to uh, share the pulpit. And uh, today's message is something related to what we were talking about in Sabbath school. And I thought that would be uh, uh, important. Uh, Noah. Noah, in the children's story. <laughs> okay, but before that, why don't, you, why don't we have a word of prayer? Father God, I just kneel before you uh, asking for your power. We know that without you, we can do nothing. In Jesus' name, amen. The title of the message is Jesus the Agoranomos. Out of all the wonderful titles that we can have for Jesus, the Prince of Peace, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, we can talk about Jesus, the Bread of Life. We can talk about Jesus, the Water of Life. We can talk about Jesus in so many different terms, the Rock of Ages. But today, I'd like to introduce you to Jesus, the Agoranomos. And you are saying, what language are you talking? <laughs> Agoranomos. What is that, right? Today you will find out that it is actually a Greek word and it was discovered serendipitously by this, your servant, when I was uh, studying uh, advanced Greek and translating ancient inscriptions. Next, please. And uh, so we're going to be looking at how this serendipitous uh, discovery of the inscription Agoranomos has to do with the investigative judgment in 1844. So, first question. Which of the following is a unique Seventh-day Adventist doctrine? A? Okay, you can click on the X here on the top. You'll have to move the cursor for some reason that came out. But the question is still uh, up in the air. Which of these is a uniquely Seventh-day Adventist doctrine? A, the doctrine of the Seventh-day Sabbath. B, the doctrine of the state of death is unconscious sleep. C, the doctrine of pre-advent investigative judgment. D, the doctrine of complete sanctification inclusive of health and wellness of our bodies. Or E, all of the above. And what do you say? C. All right. Some say it's C, some say it's E, all of the above. Well, the answer is uniquely Seventh-day Adventists. Uniquely seven the, yes. the one that is only that Seventh-day Adventists have, it must be C. 
because uh, we know of our brothers and sisters, the uh, Seventh-day Baptists, they keep the Sabbath, uh, and so do some Messianic Jews. We know that even Jehovah Witnesses hold to the doctrine of uh, unconscious sleep. We know that um, even Wesleyan communities believe in complete sanctification, even inclusive of body. But Seventh-day Adventists are unique in that they hold to a pre-advent investigative judgment. And this is why there's so much confusion, because when some of them present the, the doctrine of pre-advent judgment, other people are saying, what is that? And that makes us unique. Let's go to the next slide, please. Um, Seventh-day Adventist co-founder uh, and leader, you have to click on close again. I'm so sorry that this is, keeps on propping up. So there's lots of founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, includes, including James White, and uh, we also have uh, the uh, Joseph Bates, but of course, it would not be complete, let's go to the next slide, please, if we did not have Ellen White. Her voice and writings have been so influential to the foundation of the word, and what does she wrote in what she called the most important of all her books, The Great Controversy, page 409, she said this, the scripture which above all others have been both the foundation and central pillar of the Advent faith. What is that? Foundation and pillar. I mean, it holds up the entire doctrine of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is this declaration. Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Well, that's Daniel 8.14. Daniel 8.14 is the foundation and pillar of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Let's go on to the next slide. This is a very deep subject because it's a timeline. It gives you 2,300 days which in the context of Daniel 8 cannot be literal days. It cannot be because in Daniel 8 it talked about one goat that was an entire Persian empire and another goat which was an entire Greek empire and those empires are humongous. And then it talked about a little horn which is greater than the other two. And so these two empires did not last a few, a few hundred days or even a thousand years, a thousand uh, days. They lasted for years. And so we're talking about years. And so the 2,300 days must be years, which Daniel 9 tells us it began in the year 457, and therefore it must end in 1844. This, then, is the foundation and pillar of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Ah, that's because we need to understand the pre-advent investigative judgment. Next slide, please. What difference does it make whether Jesus began an eschatological era of judgment in 1844? Does it affect any substantial way the lives of Christians, uh, whether they are aware of this or not? I uh, attended a Christian uh, theological seminary for the last four and a half years, uh, Wesleyan, and I was one of the only Seventh-day Adventists, and I found they were loving, beautiful Christians that I was uh, drawn to, made friends with, had so much in common. What difference does it make whether they believed, they did not believe in the pre-advent judgment, and I did? Does it make any difference? I will attempt to answer this question with a resounding yes, and show you how. First, I will discuss the cleansing of the temple from another era of eschatological transition which can be typologically compared to the cleansing of the sanctuary beginning in 1844. If those words seem big to you, I'll make it simple right now. Simply, I'm not going to talk to you about Daniel or Revelation. I'm going to talk to you about the Gospel of John. Would you like that? And how the Gospel of John has to do with this final uh, prophetic judgment. Second, I'm going to show you how this serendipitous discovery of this Greek inscription sheds light into the Gospel of John and what John's Gospel has to say about this judgment. Are you ready? All right, if you want to take notes, you can take notes. If you want me to stop, stop me. Oh, it doesn't matter. But we're going to go on this journey together. Let's go to the next slide. 
Let's begin then in the Gospel of John, chapter 2. If you have your Bible, open up to the Gospel of John, chapter 2. Out of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, John is many times the favorite. It is the one that evangelists will tell people who are just coming to Jesus, if you're going to begin to read the Bible, read the Gospel of John first. Because it is a theological gospel. It's not like the other ones that just tell you the story of Jesus. This one tells you the only, in, in the first uh, book, part of the book, the book is divided into two parts, the book of signs and the book of passion. And in the first book of the, uh, the book of signs, the chapter 12 of the gospel, it shows you only seven miracles, counted, seven miracles. And each of those miracles are, are said in order that you may believe whom Jesus is. And that by believing, you may have life. And then after that, in, in every one of those miracles, it says, it is written, it is written. But after the middle of chapter 12 or so, it begins to transition when it talks about uh, Old Testament scripture and no longer says it is written, it is that it may be fulfilled. That it may be fulfilled. And this scripture happened that it may be fulfilled. That it may be fulfilled. And why? Because after chapter 12, the focus is now on Jesus' death for your sins and mine. And so the Gospel of John says the it is written part portion of Jesus' miracles, but it is fulfilled, which meaning this is the greatest climax of redemption history is the death of Jesus Christ. So the Gospel of John is full of beautiful, beautiful metaphors and, and beautiful symbols, in fact, that we're going to look at some of them right now. The symbol, for example, in John chapter 2, is if you have a subtitle, you'll notice it says the wedding at Cana. Is that right? Is that your subtitle in the beginning of chapter 2? That's right. And Jesus begins his ministry asking very uh, on the back, kind of like unobtrusively, fill those water pots with, I mean those uh, cleansing purification jugs with water. And they did. And I've been to Israel and I've seen these giant jugs that, that they still have from archaeological records from back then. And uh, they were really big. And they filled them up to the top. And then the water turned into wine. Amazing! Amazing! What is the symbol behind all this? Ah, it's beautiful. Because water and wine Wine representing blood, and nothing can purify better than the blood of Jesus Christ. So you see, John is full of symbols here. But what is also is interesting is the irony in the Gospel of John. There are two, two different stories in, in, in the same chapter. It's not just the symbols, it's also the irony. For example, if you look at Nicodemus in chapter 3, he is a very well-known, educated man, a Pharisee. But then in chapter 4, you see a woman, a Samaritan. And both of them have an interview with Jesus. And what's fascinating is that the Nicodemus, Jesus speaks so much about the, 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 the salvation to him, and yet he doesn't get it. And the Samaritan woman, he only mentions a few things about her life, and she believes. And so there's lots of different ironies and different parallels in the Gospel of John. But the parallel I want you to focus on is the parallel in John chapter 2. First, the wedding of Cana. But towards the end of John chapter 2, if you look at the second subheading of your Bible, can give me a volunteer who can read to me your second subheading in the Gospel of John. And what is in John chapter 2? What is it? Beginning in verse 13, do you have a subheading there? Jesus cleanses the temple. So in, in parallel locations, you have one story where he is at the wedding feast and another story where he is cleansing the temple. In one story, Jesus is sitting at a wedding, a wedding table. In another story, Jesus is overturning the tables of the temple. In one story, he is unobtrusive from the back providing a miracle, not wanting to be known. But in the other story, he intentionally makes himself known to all people. In one story, he is providing the joy and mirth. In the other story, he is giving judgment. 
And what unifies these two stories that seem so different of a character? Jesus seems so complex, sometimes so gentle, humble, and meek. And yet the other times, if you can click on the next slide, please. The other times he seems so... I can't fit him. I can't find the words. It's difficult to try to describe all who Jesus is. And yet it is in Jesus that these two characteristics come and blend. And you will know that both the joy and judgment are perfectly represented in the person of Jesus. So when you come to understand the judgment of Jesus, the investigative judgment of Jesus, you will know that this is also the joy for the believer at the same time. Two sides of the same coin. But speaking about coins, the coins were overturned in the judgment at the temple. He even told the people who had doves, get these things out of here. Do you remember that? And it says that he got a whip. What was he doing with a whip? I wanted to find out. What did people think he was doing with that whip? And so we did something in our uh, in a research methods class, which is go through the history of interpretation. Find out what Christians throughout history have tried to interpret or understand about a certain scripture. So let's go to the next slide. And that's what I did. And I started doing it using pictures. What was Jesus doing with that whip? This one is from the late 17th century from Luca Giordano. And what is Jesus doing with the whip in, according to this picture? He's beating him up. Next picture. Again, someone seems to be like hiding. Please don't hurt me. Because he's got a whip in his hand. Next picture, please. In this picture, again, everyone's leaving. The A, the time, 1610. Sheko de Caravaggio. In all these pictures, it seems that the, the, the whip in Jesus has is, is to strike these guys, although the age changes. And if you're looking carefully, this picture changes the customs. Do you see the customs? The, the, the clothing? Because it changes the clothing of the era. You look, you look at, the, at the architecture. It's not the architecture of the first century of the temple of Jesus' time. It is the architecture of the 16th century. And so the pictures basically represent the author's reconstruction of history according to his own worldview. Does that make sense? And this is what I found about the history of interpretation. Oftentimes, people read the Bible and they read it with the lens of their own worldview and their own life. <laughs> If things are some sort certain way in their life, then when they read the scripture, then they say, well, it must be this way because that is my experience. Does that make sense? If a temple looks like this in my day and age, it must have been that same way over then. If the people dress like this, that's how they must have dressed. If the people think like this, that's how they must have thought. And so they reconstruct history according to their own worldview. Is that an accurate way of interpreting scripture? No. no. Look at the, a couple, mu uh, couple of few more uh, pictures, and then we'll close with this history of interpretation. Next slide, please. 16th century, another whipping of a man down here on the floor. We'll go on to the next. And this is the oldest picture that I could find of a Christian drawing. And this one was in the catacomb, catacombs uh, of the early Christians. And again, Jesus has a whip, and he's beating the people out of the temple. But still, that's several hundred years removed from the time of Jesus. Let's go to the next uh, slide. So from this, from this point on, I thought, what we need to do is we don't have to look at what other people thought or what we think. We have to go into the first century. We got to take a plane and fly into the time of Jesus and find out what was Jesus doing with a whip. What did the people in the time of John, when this book was written, the Gospel of John, what did they think when they heard that Jesus had a whip in his hand? And so 
I went to Jerusalem, and they have a model of what it looked like Jerusalem in the first century. According to the description of Josephus and the archaeological records, this is a model of what Jerusalem looked like back then. Jerusalem, as you can see, had this quarter, which was known as the city of David, and at the time of Jesus, it was also the poorest quarters. The rich quarters were these over here, and then over here were the public works. But the biggest building was this one. Of course, that's the temple. It took maybe one-third of the entire city. The Brook Hidron, and on, the, on this side would have been the Mount of Olives. When Jesus entered the temple, that's when he took charge, and he cleansed the temple. Let's go to the next slide. I wanted to know more about the Gospel of John, so I said, when was the Gospel of John written? You know, some people in the early 1900s thought the Gospel of John was written in the 2nd or 3rd century. But that cannot be because of this. The first and oldest known manuscript that we have of the New Testament is a fragment of the Gospel of John. This is in the John Rylands Museum, and it is a fragment of John chapter 18, 31 through 33. Where was it uh, written? Ephesus. And when was it written? This manuscript has been found from about the year 100 to the year 125. So obviously, the writing of the Gospel of John must have been before, just like we understand the Gospel of John to have been written around the year of the decade of the 90s in the first century from Ephesus. Because when John finally was uh, freed from the island of Patmos, he went to Ephesus. And from there, he ministered to the congregation of Asia Minor. Okay, so I said, we must visit and investigate Ephesus. So get on the plane with me. Next slide, please. And we'll fly to Ephesus. There we are in Ephesus, in the map. Here's Asia Minor. Over there is uh, Greece. Over here is Palestine with Jerusalem. But John was in Ephesus. And uh, next slide, please. I went to Ephesus. And I went to the, uh, the cathedral or the ruins of a giant uh, church known as the Church of St. John, where it was thought to have been where John had uh, died and been buried. And so we went to the spot of his burial, which has been recently re-put uh, with new... Uh, mar marble uh, rock. Uh, but a friend of mine, Ephraim uh, Velasquez, an archaeologist who is very skeptical of all the things that tourist people tell you. Oh yeah, they go to Spain and says, in Spain is where such and such tomb was. No, I don't believe all that. So, so he's an archaeologist. But he was there and he said, no, no, this is from all my studies the place where John actually did die and was buried. And so we're looking at what would have been the gravesite of John. So John lived here, and John wrote the Gospel of John from Ephesus. So if he's writing from Ephesus, he's probably, his first audience would have been Ephesian Christians. So who are these Ephesian Christians? Let's go to the next slide. Well, in, in Ephesus, this is where Paul began his ministry in the year 48. In the year 52, Paul, Aquila, and Priscilla also uh, do some ministry there, though Paul does not stay. Finally, in the year 53 to 55, Paul uh, stays in, in Ephesus, and he writes the letter to the Corinthians. Um, in the year 58, Paul returns at the third and meets Ephesians at the elders at Miletus. Next slide, please. And Paul writes to the Ephesians for the Roman jail, uh, and that's the letter to the Ephesians in the year 60 to 62. In the year 64, Paul writes to Timothy, who's, who's in Ephesus. So in other words, Timothy is the pastor of Ephesus in the year 64. And then after that, uh, John's ministry in Ephesus, and John writes to the seven churches, including 
to the first, the church of, of Ephesus, and Ignatius writes the letter to the Ephesians of the year 109. So in other words, this is a well-established Christian congregation. Um, and maybe you've heard of a certain man named Onesimus. Ever heard of him? Who was Onesimus? Who's his name tied up in? What other letter? The letter to the to Philemon. Philemon. Onesimus was a slave who was freed. And this Onesimus became also, according to uh, records of uh, uh, historical records, he became the pastor also of the Ephesus church. So if the church of Ephesus was a Christian center for a very long time. So we have to put ourselves in the feet of the people of Ephesus. How did they live? What did they understand about all the things that John was saying? Next slide, please. All right. This is what the city used to look like. I mean, this is what it looks like today. Sorry. These are the ruins of modern day of what was ancient Ephesus at the time. The biggest conspicuous sign is the number seven down over here, which is the giant, uh, giant theater where they started yelling, Great is Diana of the Ephesians! Remember? And Paul wanted to talk to them, but, but they said, No, they'll kill you! Uh, and so another thing over here is the, the high class, the uh, Aristarchs who lived here. But over here, if you notice this green space, that's the, that was the um, Agora, the marketplace. The Agora is the Greek marketplace. And over here, they made a library, the Library of Celsus, which is an icon in, in Ephesian tourism today. Let's go to the next slide so you can see what I'm talking about. This is the Library of Celsus, or Celsus, as it was known in Greek. Have you seen this icon before, maybe in the, the internet or something like that? It's a beautiful place, right? And this is where they would put the scrolls, the, the ancient scrolls, because it wasn't like book form, codex, it was scrolls. So that's how the library was formed. And it was also a place of lecture hall, because in ancient times, the libraries were not a quiet place. They were a noisy place, because books were never read quietly. They were read out loud. And so when you have a certain reader, he opens the book and he reads out loud so all people can hear, and that's why you go to the library. But here I was in the Library of Celsus, and then I took a class with uh, Dr. Fred, Frederick Long, who uh, said to us, I'd like you guys to be so good that you can translate ancient inscriptions. So he went about the city of Ephesus, and he started taking snapshots of the inscriptions that he found there, and he said, here, just here, he passed out the pictures and he's like, translate that, translate that. And by random <laughs> passing of pictures, he gave me this inscription. If you could uh, click on the next slide, please. Right over there, where the arrow is pointing, right there, there's an inscription right there. And that is kitty corner to the opening of what used to be the Agora, the bazaar or the marketplace. Make sense? And what did I find there? Go to the next slide, please. I, lo and behold, had to translate this giant inscription. And this is what I translated. To good fortune. Marcus Aurelius Iuticus Menacratus, friend of Augustus, has become Agoranimus, which means marketplace director. He has become Agoranimus, Purely and firmly and loving honor. Blessings. And then it repeats to another one and another one and talk about this great honor to be the Agoranimos. And I'm like, what is an Agoranimos? I needed to know. So, you know, in my research of going so deep and studying all these things, finally I said, you know, I'm taking a lot of time. Let me just go to Google and Wikipedia. <laughs> So I, I decided to finally decide to go to, to go to this wonderful modern day research, Wikipedia, next slide please, and find out what is Agoranimos. And Wikipedia says uh, that some of the duties were setting prices of certain goods, certifying goods and weights and scales, controlling money exchange, and controlling unscrupulous merchants, and Agoranimos, had rights to impose corporal punishments and was often portrayed walking along the Agora with a whip for non-freeborn and imposed fines 
for free citizens. And Aguaranos also kept an eye on temples in the Agora. In other words, the Aguaranos, according to another more uh, uh, authoritative dictionary, says that it was a legal term for public officials attested in a large number of Greek cities. Their duties consisted of supervising the commercial aspects of the Agora. The commercial aspects of the Agora. And they were depicted as holding a whip. Now, mind you, the depiction in all these other agora, uh, of these portraits of, of uh, agoranimals of the time was never beating somebody. They held a whip, just as a police officer today would hold a badge. Does that make sense? He was not beating people. He was holding the whip as one who had authority, as a badge that said, I am the Agoranimos here. You do what I say. And the people believed him. Wow. There's more to this than meets the eye. Next slide, please. I said, let's look at each one of those points of the Agoranimos, and let's study how it applies to Jesus. First, he had to keep order in the Agora in the marketplace or place of meeting. If you can tell, this was, this is a pictorial reconstruction from archeological evidence of an ancient polis, of an ancient Greek city, and there must be order, otherwise it's chaos, because everyone floods here and anybody could just be ripping people off. And so the Aguaranos made sure that people would sell at a right price that they would sell at a good scale. He would go to the places to make sure that their weights and scales were right and they were not ripping them off. Because if they had a, a deficient weight, then they would sell for more money, less goods. Make sense? So he had to, the Aguaranos had to make sure that people were not ripping off other people. So there was justice in commerce. Also inside the marketplace nearby were temples. One of his duties was to make sure that there was purity in the temple. And the concept of purity in ancient times, mind you, was not what we think of purity today, like, oh, but it is a purity of space. You, being unclean, cannot enter into a clean space. When I went to India, I found that out really quick because I was helping in an orphanage and they had a little sacred area and someone asked me, well, go ahead and clean up. So I started cleaning up and I went inside and all the children gasped at what I was doing. I entered the sacred space with my shoes on. I could not do that. That was a no-no. That was that was crossing the line. And so in ancient times, this also, this idea of purity had to be checked. You could not enter into a holy spot being uh, impure. And so he had to make sure that uh, in front of the temple and in, in temple areas that people were not buying and selling and things like that. They also had to uh, make sure that the, that there, the, the people who were there had license to be there. You set up shop is because you rented the space. And if you did not have license, he would kick you out. And he would get them all out. And so the Aguaranimos was the authority figure, the person in charge of all that area. And so therefore, it was a place, a position of very high honor. Are you following me? Are you see how the research is going? All right, let's go to the next slide, please. So, in, in Jesus' hand, the whip, of course, uh, would represent the badge of his authority. He just had to hold it up and say, get these things out of here. Yes, he overturned tables, but it doesn't mean that he was like crazy and hitting people and stuff like that. Because even with the doves, he knew that if he would have pushed them in the floor and thrown them off, the doves would have been would have gotten hurt. But he did not hurt the doves. He said, pick them up and take them out of here. Does that make sense? Look carefully at the details of scripture. He says, get them out of here. He does not throw them out. 
He does not just liberate them and let them fly off. He is careful with them. He is ever gentle and yet has to do justice. That's what it's like here. That's right. You have, thank you for showing that picture. Next slide, please. So I read. Making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. Thank you, yeah. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. My father's house is a key term for temple or sanctuary, right? They were crossing that line. They were crossing the line of the sanctuary, the holy space. Next slide, please. So, in summary, here are the reasons for the actions of the animals. First, I got to make a point. According to historical records, the book of uh, Antiquities of the Jews by Josephus, uh, the service of selling animals for offerings and exchanging coins for temple tax was a good service because people from the diaspora who lived far away from Jerusalem, even as far away as Galilee, would be too difficult for them to be carrying their lambs and their offerings from very far away to this place. The animals could have died. So they carried money instead. And when they came to the temple, they exchanged the money and then they bought some of the animals that were actually uh, bred in Bethlehem. Ever heard of shepherds in Bethlehem when Jesus was born? In fact, Bethlehem has been a place of shepherding for a very long time. Wasn't David, the son of Jesse, a shepherd? And so they would take shepherd, she they would take sheep that was bred in Bethlehem, nearby Bethlehem, and brought into the, uh, to the temple. And here's a side point. The fact that Jesus was born in a stable in Bethlehem, doesn't that give you a little hint that he was to die as the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world? For the sheep in Bethlehem were destined for sacrifice, those which were born in, uh, in mangers in Bethlehem. But going, closing that parenthesis and going back to this, people would come from far away to have the But Josephus tells us that they had the money changing and the animal buying in the Mount of Olives, geographically connected but separated from the holy place. How do we know that this was known as a holy place and not that? Because of what Jesus himself said in uh, that uh, intriguing remark that is also recorded in the three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where it says, when you see the abomination of desolation set up in the, you know how it ends? Holy place, he who is in the city, run away. Run away. What holy place and what is the abomination of desolation? It was when the Romans came and they established their idolatrous standards, which were like spears with ugly idols in the top. And they could still not enter into the temple because of the walls, but because the, the, the mountain itself near the temple was holy in connection to the holiness of the temple, that was still a holy place. And so when the Romans surrounded Jerusalem, they put their standards on this holy mountain right next to it. That was still known as holy ground. And so... According to the elders of ancient times, they said the buying and the selling must be done outside of the holy place, in the Mount of Olives. But where were they when Jesus came to the temple? Were they out in the Mount of Olives? No. They were mixing the common with the holy. A danger that we are often faced with today as well. Mingling what is clean and what is unclean, what is holy and what is not holy. There are things that are common that don't necessarily have to be bad. That you can listen to six days of the week. That you can do six days of the week, but on the seventh day is a holy day. Isn't that right? But here we have Jesus. 
He enters the temple and needs to cleanse out something that's being done wrong. Let's find out what are the three things that the Auranos has to do. Number one. Next slide, please. The holiness of the temple precinct needs to be cleansed because it's being defiled. As I said, there was holy ground inside the temple. It needed to be cleansed from the defiling of the common act of buying and selling on the holy day. It's interesting that the Sabbath day has been defiled by Christians for so long, hasn't it? The Sabbath day, Christians, God's people, for so long have been trampling on the seventh day because they got the wrong day. <laughs> and yet, God has been merciful until the time of a judgment. When Jesus comes and says, it's time to cleanse that which is holy. The time has come to make the holy holy and the common common. Does that make sense? It's the time of the judgment. Next slide, please. The crooked practices of trade needed to be checked. In ancient times, all traders were known as cheaters. It's in the literature of antiquity. If you called someone a tax collector or a trader, you know, someone who traded, it's, you were saying, you're a cheater. You're a cheater. And it's too easy to cheat when you're in charge of the money when it comes to buying and selling and there's no one over you or nobody whom you are accountable to. And so it is said that this practice, and I think it's also recorded in the Desire of Ages as well as in other literature, that this practice had gone too far. Actually, in fact, the Dead Sea Scrolls talk about the cheaters in the sanctuary. The Dead Sea Scrolls were a community of saints that left the temple because they said, these guys are crooked. They're a bunch of cheats. They're no holy people at all. God does not look uh, at the priest with good eyes. That's what they, they, they mentioned. So there was a people in the first century who, who knew that this evil practice was going on. And what is this evil practice that they were doing? Well, the people would come, and they would look at the sheep that they would bring, and they said, sorry, buddy, that sheep is not gonna, it's not gonna fly. It has a little spot right there. What, it's been, no, it's got a spot. You, you, you gotta get rid of, what am I gonna do? You can sell it to that guy over there. So they would sell it to that guy, and that guy would buy it for like super cheap. He's like, what am I gonna do this, this cheap? This sheep is like worthless. It does. It has a. You can't sacrifice it. I'll give you very little money for it. Okay, fine, fine. Take it. So they would sell it really, really cheap, and then they put it in a little uh, corral. And then he would come, and then he says, "Well, I'd like to buy a, a good sheep. Oh, you can't buy it that with that money. You have to buy it with the currency of the temple. Well, where do I get that? Over there at that guy. So then they would charge high prices to get the the most money as they could from the, uh, from the exchange of the money. And when he finally had the temple tax, they're like, okay, I have the temple money. All right, now you can buy my sheep. And then he would sell his sheep at a very high price because he was the only one who had the, the special sheep or whatever, you know? It's kind of like going to the airport and trying to buy a water bottle. It's like, what? You're charging me $8 for a water bottle? Sorry, buddy, take it or leave it. <laughs> you, you, they have a monopoly. Of, of water bottles there. So they had a monopoly of the, of the sale of, of but the, the thing was that they would get the sheep from the same ones that were being sold and they would just recycle them through and they would just sell the same sheep at a very high price. All this in the name of, oh, it's for the money of the Lord. For the money of the Lord. My eye, Jesus had enough. How could this crooked practice go on? And so Jesus came in to cleanse the wickedness of the hearts of these priests. How dare they? They made it into a den of thieves. That's what they did. Next slide. And finally, what they were doing was not just wrong because it was in the holy precinct. It wasn't just wrong because they were doing crooked practices, but it was wrong because they were being an obstacle for the worship of other people who came from far away. Notice, Jesus said to them, this house has become a, a house of prayer, has been called a house of 
Prayer for all nations. Did you hear that? All nations. That means all Gentile nations as well could come and worship. But the Jews had made a dividing wall. And I have seen the evidence for this wall because I went to the Archaeological Museum in Istanbul and I noticed that there was an inscription of a wall that said, from this point forward, no Gentile can enter except at the penalty of his own death. So that's a very nice welcome sign, you know? Welcome to worship. Pass here and you die. You know? <laughs> Imagine, this is not very nice. I mean, if you had it there in your, in your foyer, welcome to worship. If you're not Seventh-day Adventist, just stand right over there and don't get any closer because if you come, we'll kill you. <laughs> wow, well, that's not very nice, is it? Well, then where did they have to worship when they would come to pray? And when they, they, there was a wall right there, separated that area. And they had to worship from far away. And they would come to pray, lifting up holy hands, as the scripture says. And then they the kneel before the Lord. But at the same time, there's the wall, there's far away. And guess who was beside them while they were praying? Mr. Ox. Oh. Ah, exactly. And guess what nice smells were there? Mr. Poop nearby. <laughs> And guess who else was there? Mr. Tax uh, ch changing of money changers. And the argument, the bickering of back and forth of people when they're in a merchant uh, area. A marketplace is not a place of worship. And so, what was to be a house of prayer for all nations has become a den of thieves. And Jesus, this was the last straw. It was enough. It was enough that they were in the holy place. It was enough that they were being crooked. But when he saw people from far away wanting to worship the true God, his, his eyes must have teared up and said, No, no, this cannot be. They need to come to worship the true God. They need to know who the true God is. I think Jesus was most passionate when he saw real, genuine, innocent seekers of God being drawn away from the truth because of those who supposedly had the truth. That's why he said, it would be better that your neck would be tied up to a giant millstone, and I've seen those also in ancient Israel, they're big, giant millstone, and be flung into the depth of the sea and just drown. Why would he say such deep words? It would be better for that to happen than somebody to be a stumbling block to one of the little ones, to one of these little children. So Jesus was really passionate about making sure that other people would know the truth. And they would be an obstacle of true worship for the pilgrims from far away. These are the reasons why Jesus had to make a decision. A decided stand, grab a whip, become the Aguaranos, because no one else was doing it, and because it was his rightful duty as the Messiah. You know, the time is coming, or the time has come, when Jesus has looked at the earth and he has said, it is enough. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so it shall be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. But before the actual flood came around, God told Noah, Noah, there's going to be 120 days of grace. But the time of judgment has already come, for I have already decided to make the judgment clear. This earth will be destroyed by water. And 1 Peter, 2 Peter tells us that it won't be water, but fire next time in the days of the Son of Man. And Jesus has already made a decree since 1844. This earth must be cleared of judgment. Why? Because of the defiling of the holiness, because of the wicked practices that are in the hearts of people that need to be changed, and because those who would come to the knowledge of truth are continually being obstructed by those who say that they are in the truth. Jesus now stands as the Agoranimos of the Holy Sanctuary in Heaven. It's time to cleanse the sanctuary. Next slide, please. The Jews question his authority. What sign do you show us for doing these things? Destroy this temple, Jesus said, and in three days, I will raise it up again. Next slide. Oh, it has taken us 46 years to build this temple. You will raise it up in three days? 
But Jesus was speaking about the temple of his body. So you see, Jesus, even here in the Gospel of John, he's using images, he's using metaphors, symbols. He says this temple, and yet Jesus was obviously cleansing this temple, the real temple. And yet he referred to his body temple. Next slide, please. When Paul said, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? That was 1 Corinthians 6, 19. He was basically asking them, hey, everyone should know this, right? Because he says, don't you know? That's a rhetorical question, you know? Don't you know? In other words, they knew. In the first century, it was common knowledge that the body was considered temple. Next slide, please. So if you look at ancient rabbis, Rabbi Chaim of Rosin, the renowned student of Gaon of Vilna, said that the commandment of construct a tabernacle is primarily a personal commandment. Every Jew, he said, is a living tabernacle in miniature. And Sefer Charedim, the book of the Osrach, says, you are a temple of the presence of the Holy, of the Holy King. Next slide, please. I could show you more uh, of this, like uh, the Beit Hamikat Shesh is a microcosm of the human body. And it says, if you look at the plan of the sanctuary, you will notice the placement of the various vessels, the altar, the table, the mineral, all correspond to the locations of the vital organs of the human body. In other words, each of the temple's vessels represents a human organ. The 613 mitzvot directly correlates to 613 parts of the human body, etc., etc. Next slide, please. What he's trying to say is that the body is a temple. That was common knowledge of the time. How did they know that? By interpreting Genesis 2, verse 7. God creates the dust, a human being, and he blows into it the spirit of power, and the man becomes a living being, inhabiting a uh, beautiful uh, being. Now, the image of God is created uh, as, as, as is this pact. Uh, next slide. The point is, the soul temple was something interpreted at that time to be the, the sanctuary of, of God. It can dwell within you. So the fact that the Jerusalem temple was being represented as the soul temple, and Jesus cleanses the Jerusalem temple as the Agoranumos, this, therefore, uh, as syllogism, means that Jesus is also here to cleanse our soul temple. Does that make sense? Yes, there is a sanctuary in heaven and there's a sanctuary on earth. But Jesus is also interested in, in cleansing the sanctuary of our life. Does that make sense? Next slide, please. Here's the typological representations and how they fit in. Jesus worked as the Agoranimos in a physical temple, he works in our life, our spiritual temple. That was local, this is universal for all human beings. This happened during the first advent, this cleansing of our temple will be in the second advent. This happened at the end of the 70 weeks of Daniel chapter 9. This happens at the end of 2,300 evenings and mornings of Daniel 8.14. Next slide, please. Here's a timeline of the first temple, uh, and it's uh, at the end of the 70 weeks. And uh, the reason I portray this timeline of the end of the 70 weeks is so that you can know uh, uh, an interesting point. And it's the point of when Jesus cleansed the local temple. According to John chapter 2, this was right after the wedding of Cana, which was his first miracle. So if this took place in his first miracle, was that in the year 27 or 28? Or was that close to the death of Jesus? When did Jesus commence his miracle, his, his ministry? What year? It was the year 27, 28, soon after he was baptized. Is that correct? However, if you read the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they also talk about a temple cleansing, don't they? 
But they put it right at the end of Jesus' ministry, right before he's crucified. Isn't that right? Am I, am I right? Are you following me? So in other words, there were two temples, temple cleansing. The first temple cleansing, Jesus calls it my father's house. In the second temple cleansing, uh, towards the end of Jesus' life, he called it your house. It's left unto you desolate. And next slide. The, 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 the point here is if, uh, we'll go back if you could, you know how to go back in, the, in this slide. The point is in the first one over here, that was a warning in the beginning of his ministry on earth. He comes up to the scene, he throws the overturning temple, and he says, I am the Agoranimos. I am the Messiah. Your time is limited. This is a warning to the temple in Jerusalem. And yet for three and a half years, Jesus still graciously continues to work with the Jewish nation for three and a half years, knowing that their time of probation will soon come to an end. So towards the end of Jesus' ministry, that is the close of probation for the Jewish nation. That's why when he dies, he says, first of all, your house is left unto you desolate. The presence of God has come out of the Jewish temple, and the temple curtain is ripped into, no longer is the local earthly temple of any worth in the eyes of God. Does that make sense? And that was, that was God's house. So the close of probation happened at, over here. And yet, the destruction of Jerusalem did not happen until the year 70. Isn't that interesting? Next slide, please. So look at the correlation between the cleansing of Jesus' temple of the, in the first century with the cleansing of the sanctuary at the end. First, there is a manifestation, a manifestation in 1844 of Jesus saying, I have begun this final ministry as the Agoranimus Messiah in the end. And if you do not shave up, there is going to be a close of probation at the end. Does that make sense? And even then, that is not when the earth will be destroyed, the close of probation. It will be a space of time, just like it was for Jerusalem Temple, until the second coming of Jesus. Do you see the parallels? You see the, the symbolism behind all this? Next slide, please. So, as the Agorano was back then, Jesus ensured proper order, sets and enforces standards, protects sacred space. How does that apply today as Jesus the Aguaranimos when he began his ministry in 1844? Let's look at them. First, let's look at the passage and see the verbs that Jesus does back then and see how he does that today as our Aguaranimos. The scripture says that when Jesus went there, he found in the temple those who were selling oxen, sheep, and doves, and money changers seated. The first test, the first thing Jesus does is that he's seeking and looking in our soul temple, and he finds things, doesn't he? If you invite Jesus to come into your life, he's going he's gonna to begin to see things in your life. And he's going to sometimes let you see what he sees. Sometimes he gives us children so, so that we can see that we're not so patient as we thought we were. Oh, at least that's for me. Sometimes he shows you things in your life with a neighbor, a co-worker, or someone, and then you realize, that's inside of me. And he shows you things, and he finds things in there that shouldn't be there. Then he makes a scourge of cords. That is, he takes up his rightful position, takes the badge, and says, if you're willing, if you invite me to be your Lord and Savior, I will be your Lord. I will be your animals. I'm in charge of your life. And then he drives out all that don't belong there out of the soul temple. 
And this is most beautiful. Because Jesus, when he was on this earth, he often had to use the same word, drive out demons and unclean spirits. That's the same word as the Latin exorcism. Jesus has to sometimes cast out the things that are in our life that are an obstacle to true worship. He poured out the coins of the money churches, overturned the table. Sometimes it has to be a drastic change of our lives. But sometimes he simply speaks to us and he says, take these things away. He tells us, I'm in charge, but I'm not going to force you to do something. I'm going to tell you, do this for me. And you will choose, yes, you are my Lord. I will do that for you. Next slide. See, here's some type of typological considerations to go a little bit deeper. If there's things that are uh, obstacle to true worship, if there are things that are being an obstacle for your own worship, are you spending time with the Lord? What is being an, an obstacle in your life? As a friend of mine told me, what is often an obstacle in our generation for true worship is that we are too busy. I don't have time, we say. Is that right? Well, what is then the number one thing that we need? My friend told me, you need to drastically and ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. So the first thing that is in, uh, an obstacle to true worship is hurry. Be too busy. Get that out of your life. Get rid of things that are causing you to be busy. And find time to worship God. Crooked practices of trades must be checked. Are there money changers in your soul? Are there ideas where you're thinking of making it big in this world? Jeremiah 45 says that Baruch, the scribe of Jeremiah, was trying to do that. He was trying to make a business in Jerusalem. And the Lord told Jeremiah the prophet to tell Baruch, you are trying to make a business and profit here in Jerusalem? Don't you know Jerusalem's going to be destroyed in just a few more days? Don't do that. It's changing your mind from an earthly prosperity to heavenly success. It's about priorities, isn't it? And so again, Jesus wants our mind to be changed and transformed. What about dove sellers? Does he see dove sellers in your life? It's okay to sell doves for the sake of the poor. Yet, make a distinction between the common and the holy. It's okay to do several things, but if it's a Sabbath day, that's holy. Do that six days of the week, but not on the seventh day. And so all of these things all of a sudden come about since 1844, where Christ sets himself up as our our animals and says it's time to cleanse the temple. Not just the heavenly temple, to the temple of our soul. Next slide, please. If you hear Jesus knocking at the door, that's because he's asking to come in. The, the scripture says he's not just knocking on the door. If you hear his voice, that means he's calling your name while he knocks at the same time. He calls you by name. And he says, will you let me in? Yes, come in. Eat with me and I with you. This then becomes a continual feast, as the book of Proverbs says. It is a beautiful wedding feast between the God and his people, between the church and the bride and Jesus Christ. This is the wedding of Cana. And yet, this feast of being one with God is the same side of the coin, is another side of the coin of the same coin which is a coin of a relationship with God, with Jesus, but it also comes with judgment. And so you let him come in, you let him be Lord, you let him cleanse, and then you let him have a beautiful relationship with you. Will you let him into your soul temple? Will you let him be your animals today? Pray that you take some time to think about that. To think it does make a difference. 1844 is Jesus setting himself up as our Agoranamos. 
is Jesus making a final appeal and invitation. My ministry has come very soon, short after, the close of probation for all Christians. And then the earth will be destroyed. But before that time comes, before Jesus comes, he's making a final appeal where he says, let me be your agoranos. Let me enter your heart. Let me be your Lord. I will save you. I will make you live in holiness, and I will make you enjoy it if you just let me in. Do you want to do that today? I invite you to have this uh, prayer. Uh, and if you need to stay seated, be seated. If not, kneel down, however you like. And I'll invite the person who will play the piano nearby to play the final song. But just take some time while she plays some final chords and before the song begins, to let Jesus come in, if that is your desire. Just take some time and pray and say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Aguranamos today. And then as, as, a, uh, as a, maybe a minute or two of prayer, then we'll begin the, the final song. So if you want to kneel down and pray, this is your time. This is your opportunity to respond to the message.